Being World Water Day today, I would just like to bring out that we have a crown jewel in our county called the Cassville Seawater Intrusion Project that's been in operation for over 20 years, providing 12,000 acres of reclaimed uh, water from tw uh, for 12,000 acres. Um, this was built with uh, 22 <coughs> landowners all in uh, coordination to reclaim water that was pumped out five miles out in Monterey Bay, brought back in, well, that used to be pumped five miles out to the bay. We clean it up and use it to irrigate 12,000 acres. It is one of a kind, not one of a kind, but it's one of the premier water reclamation projects there is in the state. And sometimes uh, it's hidden there, but it does a fabulous job. And uh, we really need to promote that for water use and sustainability. And I'm proud of it that I've been involved since day one. So thank you for your time. Seeing none, we will go to our staff presentation then. And we have with us Mr. Brent Pukey, General Manager of the Water Resources Agency, and I believe by Zoom, uh, our consultant, Ron Drake. Yes, good morning, uh, Chair Adams and Board of Supervisors. I am Brent Pukey, and joining me via Zoom is Amy Woodrow, the Associate Hydrologist with the agency, and Ron Drake, and they will make this Zoom presentation. Good morning, Madam Chair and uh, and Supervisors. Just checking to see that you can hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you just fine. Thank you. And you can see the presentation, I hope. Yes. It's been uh, several months since we've uh, been able to present a status report on the tunnel project to you, and the last several times we spoke, we were still waiting on modeling results. Today we have a little bit of a different story. So what we... Uh, hope to do today, Amy and I are going to tag team a little bit and go through the presentation, which starts off initially by reminding us all that this is a water storage project that we're talking about. We're going to talk about uh, the updated project benefits after we did some modeling uh, changes, and also describe what the modeling changes were in sort of a summary level detail on, on what's changed and what's different. And then we'll finish with a, a discussion of what the project costs are, a, a, a picture of what the benefits are relative to the value of water and our project schedule and next steps. Um, we've included this disclaimer at the request of the USGS uh, indicating that the, the basis of this work is, is a preliminary model developed by the USGS and we are currently uh, using that model to forecast the uh, results of the, of the tunnel uh, I'd like to just uh, highlight initially that it has been a water storage project. It's really designed to capture that wet year or flood flood waters uh, that uh, have occurred over the 47 year history of the two reservoirs. Um, over that life, uh, 2.6 million acre feet of water was spilled to the ocean. And had the tunnel and spillway modification been in place over that period, Half of that could have been uh, captured and stored, about a million three uh, acre feet. And with that, uh, actually, if the tunnel and spillway had been in operation, in addition to that, we could have captured more water to transfer to uh, San Antonio for a total of about a million four acre feet over the 47 years had the project been in, in place. And more recently, that uh, we can all remember, in 2017, we had 192,000 acre feet that was spilled from Nacimiento Reservoir to the ocean. And had the tunnel project been in place, we could have captured 88,000 acre feet. So the real benefit of this project is to capture that wet year water, store it for use during the dry years. Um, this is where we are now. <clears throat> and uh, Amy's gonna talk about modeling changes in a minute. But essentially, uh, the projects combined, the tunnel plus the seven foot spillway modification of the San Antonio Reservoir generates on average, uh, based on the 47-year his, uh, historical data, if we apply the, uh, the model to it, we have a 53,000 acre foot increase in storage on average over what our baseline says. And that allows us operationally to release a, an additional 14,000 acre feet of water per year uh, as uh, conservation releases or non-flood flood control release, releases and it reduces the flood, uh, flood releases by about 17,000 acre feet. 
The project continues to support the SRDF and provides an additional 1,100 acre feet per year of water at the SRDF and an additional 15 days of duration there. This is data that's different than we presented yesterday at the Board of Directors meeting relative to the SRDF. We had an error in our data and we've since corrected that. But on this graphic, we show a little groundwater contribution and we've done some analysis and the real benefit of the projects are the contributions to the groundwater, particularly in a dry year when we would have water in the reservoirs that could support groundwater and recharge the aquifer. The actual data is hard to be precise about, but we have an estimate that we could contribute upwards of 48,000 acre feet to the groundwater aquifers. That data is summarized in this table, same table, but it splits the tunnel and the tunnel plus the spillway just to show the differences and to show the advantages of the spillway raised. Obviously, the 53,000 acre feet is a function of having that additional storage capacity in San Antonio. The tunnel itself moves on the average of about 30,000 acre feet per year and not every year, but upwards of 47 to 50% of the time, the tunnel would be useful in the water. The change in stage or elevation of the reservoirs is indicated there. Nacimiento is down a little bit by 18 feet and San Antonio by an increase of 32 feet. But overall, this is the big picture of where we are. There's definite benefits in terms of flood control release reduction, additional conservation releases, and improved flow and duration at the SRDF. The groundwater and surface water interaction was modeled to the extent it could, and this is a table that shows the various year types, wet through dry. And the real significant point is the real benefit that the tunnel projects have in a dry year over the baseline. And that's that 48,000 acre feet of additional groundwater or groundwater recharge that may be available. It's difficult to separate the groundwater recharge from the evapotranspiration element of it, but we think the majority of the water available is actually going into to recharge it. So that's one of the greatest benefits of this project is it really helps in a drought and a dry year. I'm going to ask Amy to step in a little bit and talk about some of the history and some of the process that we've gone through over the last couple of years, actually refining and adjusting the model. So Amy, if you could step in and help with this slide, I'd appreciate it. Certainly. So thank you. I just wanted to take a moment, you know, we're talking about all the changes and the benefits that we're seeing from the project and comparing it to this baseline scenario. So I wanted to frame, you know, what exactly does that mean and how did we get there? You know, we started out with this project building what we call a historical model. So it's using, you know, all actual data, actual land use that changes over time. And by building that and, you know, making it fit with the conceptual understanding that we have of the basin, we're able to calibrate a lot of the parameters in the model and, you know, things like information about the aquifers or how water moves from the surface water into the groundwater. And then we use that historical model and made a sort of as a foundation and made a second what we call the baseline model that is used as sort of a point of comparison for looking at these new projects. So all of the all the calibration, all of the actual historical data was used to form that baseline. But we made a few changes like holding land use constant throughout the entire model and incorporating present day reservoir operations and projects and having them operate throughout the entire 47 year model period. For example, you know, the Castroville seawater intrusion project came online in 1998. In the model, it operates the entire time. The Salinas Valley water project also, you know, came online in the 2000s. It operates the entire time throughout the model. And the reason that we do these, make these changes is that it reduces the variables in the model so that when we incorporate a new project to look at benefits, the changes that we see are really due just to whatever that project is that we're looking at. So in this case, you know, we looked at, you know, if we build just the tunnel, 
what those numbers would be if we looked at the tunnel plus the spillway rays, what those numbers would be. So that was a little bit um, kind of the background of how we got to these this point. So all of the changes, all the numbers that you see in the in the tables um, are comparing that baseline model to the project scenario. Ron, could you move to the next slide, please? So in the process of, uh, you know, since the last time we, we met with you in 2020 um, and had some preliminary results, we made a lot of changes to both the historical model, which were then propagated into the baseline. One of those changes was folding in all of the agency's water rights and environmental commitments. So all of the modeling complies with those parameters. Um, one of the big changes that we saw in looking at how the model was operating and making releases from their reservoirs was that in the prior version of the model that we had, it was kind of the river system was too efficient. You know, it was that we were not losing enough water um, as the water moved downstream. So in this new baseline, um, the river is a lot thirstier than it had previously been modeled, which is not a bad thing. It just means that the you know we have more water that's moving into groundwater recharge than we had previously. And because of that, you know, we, we do see some differences in the modeled benefits of the project. And you know, ultimately all of this work has given us a better baseline model that we feel is much more reflective of reality and current conditions and is more consistent with the agency's operations. And it does, you know, require us to release more water to meet downstream demands, but it's it's reflective of of the situation that, you know, as we understand it currently. So what so are the, yeah, go, yeah, ahead. go ahead. <laughs> no, go ahead. The, and this is just a couple other changes that we made. Um, you know, we looked at how we might best operate the tunnel, um, and that involved looking at different ways to release water from the two reservoirs, um, where it was prioritized, and if that gave us additional benefits. Um, so we looked at six or seven different scenarios um, and found that really the storage in the reservoirs and the physical operational constraints of the reservoirs were the limiting factors on how water was released from each one. Um, and again, finally, like I mentioned, you know, water rights are incorporated in the model, so we track it to make sure we're not exceeding our water right limits in any given year. And the models that we're using they, again, they were built on that foundation using actual measured hydrology, precipitation, climate data, and then, you know, we're, we're making simulations built on that foundation with real data. And this is just an example of, you know, one of the parameters that we reported um, is look, this graph shows average annual uh, reservoir elevation in Nacimiento, and the yellow bars show the previous version of the model that we had in 2020, the blue ones show the 2021 version. So this is an example of one of the things that changed based on all of the refinements that were made. So the average annual elevation in, during a given month is lower in the current version, and that, again, is because we are needing to release more water to meet those downstream demands because of the, the thirstier river um, and the additional groundwater recharge that's being simulated. And this is a table that sort of summarizes the differences in those two baselines, 2020 and 2021. You can see that there's a fair amount of change uh, and reduction, for example, in storage as a result of, uh, of the baselining. But the baseline, the 2021 baseline is a much more realistic forecast or a realistic tool that uh, Andy mentioned to really forecast reality. And so we think we've got a, a solid model now that produces good results, and you can see the differences. But uh, the old numbers that we predicted in terms of uh, conservation releases are now out of date and not accurate, and the numbers that we're working with now are based on the changes over the 2021 baseline, which we think is, is the real baseline to work from. Um, so, as uh, Amy noted, and I uh, may repeat a little bit of what she said, but essentially now they're, uh, we're holding land use constant, which was different than before. Uh, we are assuming that both reservoirs are fully functioning, fully operational across the entire year, and uh, we've held that uh, steady and have added 
led the Tunnel and Spillway Project in analyzing various scenarios. I think multiple scenarios were looked at uh, in the various uh, uh, modeling runs, and we've uh, tried to optimize uh, where we think the, uh, the best uh, operation is to, uh, to get the greatest effect from the project. <coughs> Uh, and as Amy noted, the uh, Salinas River is quite thirsty. It sucks up more water than we thought. Um, but um, it uh, is, is a groundwater recharge, which is beneficial. And we note that the tunnel does a very good job of moving uh, quite a bit of water from Nacimiento to San Antonio, especially in the end of wet years. So that increased storage that we gain from this project is is essentially more water. Sometimes I call it new water, but it's not new water. It's just more water available than we have now, and especially evident in the non-wet or the dry and drought years. One of the one of the good things about the model now is that it's got a lot of data in it, and it's a good evaluation and modeling tool. Uh, we can incorporate things like future land use and climate change and other things to uh, to model that analysis. And significantly, we might be able to look at how can we use the, uh, the model to evaluate the benefits of releasing water in the third consecutive dry year, as an example. So a strong tool to help us uh, forecast the performance of the project, which is summarized again here for you. Uh, again, 53,000 acre feet of additional storage, 14,000 acre feet of additional conservation release and 1,100 acre feet of, of uh, additional water at the SRDF. So what are the benefits from the project? Obviously the aquifer is gaining more water uh, from the releases. Uh, its uh, uh, greatest benefit, as we mentioned, is, is dry year because we've got water available to release in the dry years and more water available for beneficial use and also environmental use as needed. So um, and one of the things that the model hasn't really considered, but one of the operational things that's significant here is that with San Antonio having more water, it can function to meet demands if the Nacimiento um, reservoir goes down, for example, a little level outlet or something has a problem that's operationally down, the San Antonio reservoir is now able to meet the downstream demand. So that's an operational benefit that hasn't been really noted before. Uh, and lastly, obviously, there's more water down the river to the SRDF and increases those operational days for the SRDF. So what does it cost and what's the benefit? First of all, what have we spent to date? What have we accomplished? Uh, this is just a simple table that shows uh, sort of the summary of the uh, work that's been done uh, prior to the DWR grant, which was funded by a loan from the county to the Water Resources Agency. And then we have a, had a $10 million grant, which started in September of 2016, and we've spent about $8.1 million there, a total of $11 million spent so far in the development of the project. We have about $1.8 million remaining in that grant to try to finish the balance of the work uh, under the DWR grant work plan. And that's sort of summarized again here. This is just a table of where we are with the grant. 81% complete and a, a fairly lean 1.8 million left to get the rest of the work done. But, but we, we still have funding, we're working hard to get the work completed within that, within that budget. Um, the capital costs of the project uh, are, uh, we, we did a recent uh, cost estimate update. We're right now at about $226 million for the tunnel and the spillway modification, which includes uh, all of the uh, uh, Operating reserves, uh, O&M costs, contingencies, etc. So our capital budget is about 226 million. The funding for that has been obviously a loan from uh, the county to the Water Resources Agency at the 10 million dollar DWR grant, and we have a grant agreement with the California Division of Fish and Wildlife for 17 million dollars to offset the cost of the fish screens. And so if you look at the uh, actual uh, amount that we may need to finance it, either under Prop 218 or another mechanism, a grant from the state or the federal government, it's about $200 million that may be needed to, uh, to pay for the project. Uh, and the idea was that the county's funds would be repaid from, from that funding source. So that's the big picture that we're looking at, about uh, $200 million to finance. And this, this slide's a bit busy, but the capital costs on the left are summarized at $226 million. 
And the financing, conceptual financing plan on the right is that it would simply be 30-year bonds uh, at 5%, which is maybe a bit conservative, but uh, it shows a debt service that, that we would need to service of $14 million a year. And the question is, how do we pay for that and, and what do we get for that? So we've got a $226 million capital cost, an annual O&M and debt service of about $14 million. So if you take that $14 million and you try to analyze the, the, the how do we pay for it and what are its benefits, these are some just some uh, measurement tools. They're not what we necessarily forecast, but this would be just a just a per acre cost. So if you took that $14 million and you divided by, for example, all of the land except rye, farming, grazing, and bacon, 257,000 acres, that's about $56 an acre. Now that, that does not assume that we're looking at a flat tax or anything like that. There will be a uh, engineer's report done and a cost allocation study to, to uh, be fairly allocate benefits, et cetera. But just as a rule of uh, measurement, $56 per acre is about the round number it would take for all the acreage uh, that, that benefits from the project to fund that debt service. But then if you were to say, well, what is the water worth? You know, what do we get out of it? And the table on the right sort of shows the differences. You know, we've got increased storage, we've got changes in flood release and increased conservation releases. If, if you look at some of those just singularly by themselves, for example, if you just took the uh, conservation releases of 14,000 acre feet per year, that has a cost by itself to pay the whole project of about $995 per acre foot per year for those 30 years. And then if you looked only at flood control releases, it would be about $840 per acre foot. And obviously you can see the dry here, but one of the things that I think is significant is that the increased storage by itself, if that's all we looked at, is about $268 per acre foot per year to, to add that 53,000 acre feet of additional storage that we gain at every year. So this is sort of a just, just an attempt to talk about um, value versus cost. And all, people always say, well, how much is it going to cost? And, you know, people's definitions of what's the value of water, what's the cost of water are different. But the bottom line is, if, uh, the real way to measure the cost is how much will it cost you if you don't have any water? And so um, this, is, this is an effort to try to demonstrate the benefits, the uh, cost benefits of the project. Moving forward, our schedule uh, shows that our grant term ends the uh, end of January 2023, will not be extended, so we're working hard to complete the uh, activities that need to be completed per the grant agreement, which includes the EIR. We're approaching a, a draft EIR that will be ready for public review here in the next month or so, and uh, hope to have CEQA approval, or at least EIR certification by, by the end of the grant term or shortly thereafter. Um, parallel with that, we'll be uh, working to get regulatory permits in place, and you can see that the engineer's report is still yet to be done now that we've got uh, modeling pretty well completed and our draft EIR is pretty well formalized. We can commence with the engineer's report, which will include the cost allocation studies and all of the things that go into what you would, we would use for a Prop 218 election if that's the way that is the logical way to finance the project. Obviously, parallel to this are our efforts with the state to go after the uh, excess budget to help fund the project and also some uh, ideas about trying to go after federal funding for the project as well. But if, if we can hold this schedule, um, we hope to be in a position to have a shovel-ready project by the first quarter of 2023 that could apply for state or federal funding and also maybe be in a position for some kind of a Prop 218 election or other financing with the idea that we would hope to start and be able to start designing construction of the project in uh, uh, mid-2023. So our next steps, number one, stay the course and get the EIR completed and present the findings, which we're doing today, of the benefits to the stakeholders, and we will present it to the GSA. Logically, this is a project for a GSP to consider. And so we'll continue to present our findings and our data to the, to the stakeholders and the agencies. There's an outstanding question at San Antonio. We've included a spillway modification in the project, but not the uh, repairing of the uh, spillway chute. 
And so that's a project that's logically to combine from a construction standpoint. If we're going to modify the spillway itself, we should modify the chute or repair the chute at the same time. And so that's an added cost. It's not included in the numbers, but it's a point of discussion for the agency to consider and plan for. Now, obviously, we're going to be preparing the regulatory permits, prepare the engineer's report for the 218, and seek federal and state funding for a shovel-ready project. Shortly before we get to the end of the EIR process, we will be soliciting requests for qualifications for design-build contractors and for spillway modification contractors, which will be part of the element to get the project shovel-ready. With that, I'm happy to take any questions, Amy and I are, about our presentation today or any ideas or suggestions you may have. Thank you very much for the presentation. It's very eye-opening. I really, really appreciate all the time and effort that have gone into this. Do you have any other comments you'd like to make, Mr. Booth, before I take that? Thank you. Thank you very much. So quickly, I'll go to staff, I mean, to the board for questions, and then I'll take it out to the public for questions and comments. Um, Mr. Ray, do you have any questions at this point? Please ask you. So on, uh, I don't think the slides are, on page 20 of the slide, where we're talking about the, um, the cost, the value proposition, that's the annual debt service cost per acre that we're measuring. Right, right. Okay. Um, and then on the, um, going, going back when we're talking about the assumption, um, you know, I know that, I know that with climate change, we are experiencing, you know, drier climates, more extreme weather systems. And so looking at the years when we do our annual average of all year types, going back 50 years, I know that um, if we were to, was, was there any consideration of looking at sort of the past 20 years, acknowledging that the climate has changed? Uh, um, yes, that question was brought up yesterday at the board of directors meeting about looking at the last, you know, since 2000 or the last you know 10 or 15 years or so as a more realistic uh, forecast of climate. But I think Amy, my comment that we've incorporated some of that in the EIR. Amy, can you respond to that? Sure. Yeah. So I guess to the first part of the question, we did not parse it out um, looking at the more recent years, but that is something that we could do if those numbers were of interest and. As part of the EIR, we did also look at a future climate scenario. Uh, we modeled a sort of a mid-range climate scenario for 2070. Um, so that data will be in the EIR. And what it was interesting, what we saw was that, you know, the generally speaking inflow to the reservoirs was, it was fewer, um, you know, bigger gaps in between the large events. But on the whole, we actually saw a 20% increase in reservoir inflow for that 2070 climate future. Um, which there is benefit to having this additional storage when those large events come in. Okay, thank you. I think that's, uh, that's helpful. I'm just trying to understand, you know, if there are changes happening, and you know, what do they look like, and how does that impact what are, um, you know, the, 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 the need for the project, as well as, um, you know, I think it's not just consistent either, right? So we know that there's, um, whether events will become more severe, whether they are dry or wet, um, so being prepared for that. Um, I think those are my questions for right now. Thank you. Thank you. And I see Supervisor Leo has his hand here, so go ahead and go next, and I'm going to go back to um, Supervisor Phillips and Supervisor Lopez. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, I'm excited to get this presentation in its refined version. We, we had, a, I think, an earlier version in last September um, with some rough numbers, and even prior to that, we, we had been waiting at, uh, at least a couple of years uh, to get the latest numbers, and, and I'm glad to see Ron Drake is still on this project. It's been years. Um, trying to move this forward through a lot of different hurdles and procedures and, um, and uh, um, phases of the project. So this is, these, are, these numbers are, are very promising. Um, the costs are very reasonable. I know um, Supervisor Phillips and I are, are part of a, uh, the Pajaro Valley Flood Management Agency and they're going through a 218. And farmers over there are very supportive of, of trying to increase greater flood protections and the costs that they're looking at are even greater than what these numbers are per acre uh, uh, foot of water um, that, 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 that was just presented to us. So Mr. Drake or, or uh, Mr. Buki, do we, um, I, I know you put the caveat at the beginning by the U.S. Geological Survey on the numbers, and these are refined. 
uh, can you just explain what it, when, at what point do, does, do the numbers um, become more assured, or do they always remain kind of this, the, kind of the best um, estimate using the modeling? Will we always expect that, or, or, or do we expect that at some future point we will say, okay, these numbers are actually finally approved by the federal agencies, and, and, and then they can be described that way? Yeah, I'll, I'll let uh, Amy answer that question. She's working directly with the USGS. Certainly. So the, the disclaimer at the beginning is included because the model that we're using is not a published, um, publicly available product from the USGS right now. So in terms of process, we are not intending to make any further changes to the model as it is. So I think these numbers, uh, you know, we're not expecting them to change. We're not planning to do any further runs. The product that we use to do this work is going through internal USGS review to make sure that it's consistent with their fundamental science practices, and it's expected to be uh, released for to the public at the beginning of 2023. Great. I think, I think to answer your question, we, we need to sort of draw the line in the sand and say these are the numbers. Let's try to make the project work based on these numbers and try to get the financing based on these numbers. So that's, that's where we are. Right, and, and this is so important because um, um, it's, it's important for the public um, and for stakeholders in the Salinas Valley to understand these are the numbers. They're, we don't expect them to change. They're just going to go through the internal um, procedural approvals that U.S. Geological Sur Survey goes through uh, to kind of uh, approve um, and publish its, its report here. But, but I think this is the information that a lot of stakeholders have been asking for. They wanted to see what are the benefits and what are the costs of the two big questions that this answer answers them very clearly. And I and outside of that, that question, um, um, the, the other big important part to recognize, and I think Supervisor asked you framed it in the right way, is that um, our region did not it has not qualified for Prop One um, water storage infrastructure funding because we are not tied with the California Water Project or tied with the Delta. And and so some of those other major projects that are in the billions of dollars, some have, are finally making traction. Uh, Contra Costa, the Vaqueros Reservoir was approved um, by significant funding, almost a billion dollars, uh, actually seven or eight hundred million dollars in state and federal funding. And just a few days ago, uh, the Water Commission gave a green light for the sites reservoir expansion um, and approved that opened the door for another 800 million um, in state prop one funding and i think that's almost a four billion dollar project so um, when i'm looking at the overall cost of this project and, and considering our region in the future is is going to be left to um, come up with its own water solutions and water sustainability solutions um, for me, I, I, this is really looking at to the future. Where are we going to be in 5, 10, 20, and so forth? Um, where, does, where does the Salinas Valley water going to stand when it comes to water when the drought uh, constraints are going to become greater? And, and considering the overall cost of this project today compared to some of these other major projects, also, I put that in perspective, that I would say this is very small when you compare it to the multi-billion dollar other water storage projects in other parts of California. And whatever the costs are today, I think in 10 years from now, when if we're looking at this same study and it hasn't moved forward, I think it's going to be twice the, the cost um, that that we were presented in, to, in today. And I know we have been using a $150 million uh, number on the cost, but I'm, this factors in all the other associated costs and the O and M and the administration of the project and other and the and the other um, components of it. So I think this gives us a clear picture. What are the real um, Cost with everything included and monies that have been contributed so far. Um, so I, I'm, I'm excited to see this and that finally we can have a broader conversation in the Salinas Valley now that these numbers are out and now that we know what the potential costs are. Uh, so I, I thank you for this work and it allows us to move forward at a critical time when we're asking the state for money, uh, when we're having a broader discussions. This, this couldn't have come at a better time right now. So I want to thank you for bringing this forward. Uh, because this was on the way to by our communities. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so now I will um, see if Supervisor Phillips has any questions or comments. Or you want to wait for public comment? No, I, uh, I just 
concur in the comments uh, made by uh, Supervisor Leo uh, uh, that this is what we've been waiting for uh, because we've kind of been in a holding pattern. No, no one knows whether until you talk about the cost and you talk about the benefits. We don't know uh, whether we can get support for it or not, but I tend to agree. People can't uh, always forget that Monterey County is self-dependent on the water, and we don't have water coming in from the other areas. And, and so uh, I think we really should be entitled to some state money uh, to assist us like they're assisting uh, the other jurisdictions. And uh, as Supervisor Aleo mentioned, the cost of this project relative, uh, I mean, it, it looks like a lot of money, obviously, but uh, compared to the cost of other projects where you're actually building reservoirs and doing other things, uh, it, it's relatively modest uh, when you look at that. For the, when I consider considerable benefits, and it was pointed out, the benefit really is in, in the dry years, and, and that's the, to keep it sustainable. Uh, appreciate the report. Uh, uh, it's nice to see what we finally get and where we've been trying to get to for a year and a half or so. so thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Phillips. Supervisor Lopez. Thank you, Madam Chair. I've got a comment and two questions. So the comment is I'm supportive of the request to at least get some sort of a quick analysis on the last 20 to figure out what exactly that would look like during the shift in climate. Um, we heard that there was a meeting yesterday and one of the points raised was that. What else was raised at that meeting that perhaps we didn't hear about in today's presentation, key questions that were brought up by either public or members of the board? It was the, cli the climate uh, was a change scenario was brought up and then there were some questions on the benefit to the diversion facility. So yesterday, with the tunnel spillway raids, we only had one day, and Amy looked at that data last night and corrected that. I, I don't recall any other uh, comments, Ron. Was there something else? No, oh, I, I think that's the primary one. We had an error in the table that you're looking at now in terms of the SRDF, both the acre feet and, uh, and the uh, uh, at a day, so we we've corrected that error. So that's the only that's the only thing that's changed from yesterday. And I, I think Brent Brent's correct in the in the other discussion that was held yesterday. Thank you. The, the last question is SRDF related. Just wondering, we we've talked about how the river is thirstier than we ever thought, given the different modeling that we had historically. Given the modeling that's now accessible to us, have we considered that looking back at that project? just to talk about what real releases need to be and if this whole collapse, how is that impact? So prior to the model, we we were making releases downstream and that I think Amy covered it on that 2020 baseline model. We were seeing uh, additional storage in the reservoir, but with the 2021 model, that correction was made to get the water down to the SRDF that there was a greater percolation into the groundwater. And so that there is no direct impact from constructing the SRDF. I think that was your question. And so there is a benefit for having this additional storage and those, that additional 14,000 uh, acre feet available to send downstream. And then in terms of releases in order to get to SRDF, in the first year of River New Week, look at that at all? Yeah, so, so that, is, that is based on reality. And so that, that first baseline didn't have, we were seeing the releases the model were making and, and the days that we were seeing at the SRDF weren't matching up to reality because we were, we've been operating since 2010. And so that's how we were able to uh, make those modifications that, that Amy was talking about to make this 2020 version, 20, excuse me, the 2021 version of the model more accurate. And so that's where that, uh, that having fact, our actual data points, we were able to update that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lopez. Uh, now I'm going to go out to the audience present here, and then I'll go to the questions that we have uh, online. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to make questions or comments on the site? I'm going to have to leave it to 1.30.
I, uh, Mark Gonzalez, also director of the uh, Water Resource Agency. Uh, 40 miles to the north of us, $2.5 billion. That's what they're looking at for the reservoir. We're looking at $226 million for some storage. So it's pretty shocking. Uh, it's nice to see the modeling. We've seen the, the uh, project benefits page. Uh, and this is a storage project so that when we have wetter years because of the climate change, we have an opportunity to capture more of the water, which gives us a huge benefit. And also, through the new modeling, uh, we realize that the river is a lot more thirstier, so that's meaning we're using more water. So we need to store it some way. But for $226 million for something like this, I think it's a, a, it's a lot of money, but it's a good deal, and we've got good <coughs> legislative advocates uh, uh, the Legislative Committee has been doing a very good job in, in, in trying to get some of that money. And I think we're entitled to it because how we're always being left out, as Philip says. And uh, I look forward to the day, like I said yesterday, to do a ribbon cutting and see the water flow through the tunnel. Thank you very much. Mr. Bay. Uh, I've got Good afternoon again. Um, I love some chocolate up there. I'll, I'll, I'll pick that up later. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder whose chocolate that was. I thought it was a present. I was so worried I, uh, it was getting dry. <laughs> um, wonderful project. I just want to go back in history of any project, water project we've ever done in Monterey County is not gone. You know, it's been always controversial, even starting with Nancy Omeno back in the 50s. Um, so, we anticipate there's going to be pushback, there's going to be uh, lots of discussion. But the ultimate conclusion of all of this is, what are we going to do in the future, 20, I'm thinking 20, 40 years from now, for what? And red, building a new reservoir is just unrealistic in Monterey County. We don't have a, a, an area to do this. So raising San Antonio, storing more water, is what our future is. Reusing water twice is also where our future is. Homes need to be plumbed two ways. One for fresh water inside, one for recycled water for their gardens and everything else. So using water twice is the way of our future. And any projects that we can do for, to, to benefit tourism and agriculture, as this uh, water, new water storage project would be, would be wonderful for and beneficial to everybody that uses water in Monterey County. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Is there any other member of the public present who would like to make comments today? Seeing none, I'll go to the hands raised that I have. Uh, Supervisor asking your hand is up. Could we complete uh, public questions and comments first? Thank you. Okay, so then thank you. Uh, the first one is Jay Farrow. And if you uh, could unmute yourself by pressing star uh, six, then we will be able to hear your comments. And you have one minute, 30 seconds. There we go. Thank you. Um, as I pointed out in uh, remarks yesterday, um, this is a storage project that doesn't have a delivery plan that benefits areas that actually need the water. Uh, if you look at the benefits, you have 1,100 acre feet getting to the rubber dam, which is the only area that is uh, that is currently in overdraft. The average annual storage increase that's recharges is only 4,600 acre feet. And that will go to areas that are south Chular, which currently state that they're not in overdraft. So the problem we've got here is we've got a storage project that doesn't target benefits to an area that actually needs water. Uh, it, it's misleading to characterize this uh, cost per acre foot of recharge, 268 for the dry years, when in fact the average uh, year is only 4,600, it's a tenth of that. So the actual cost of water for recharge in an area that doesn't need any recharge is uh, 10 times higher, it's 2,600 acre feet. What we need is a, pre a plan that involves some kind of delivery to the north. Uh, there are some delivery projects, winter release with ASR, a new point of reversion, maybe a pipeline. But right now, this project is incomplete, and it's going to be impossible to persuade stakeholders to pay for a project that doesn't actually move the water where it's needed. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. Uh, next, I have Margie Kay. Good morning. Um, thank you. 
you, uh, Supervisor Adams. So I live in the very northern part of the Monterey County Water Resource Agency um, boundaries, and um, and we live in the hills up here. So I'm just curious, um, what if this inner lake tunnel does not get built? There was, I know that $10 million, I think, of safe uh, DWR grant money. Was there any more grant money you received? And if so, would it have to be returned if the project doesn't get built? Just, just what if? And um, does it does San Luis Obispo County still have to approve the tunnel because it is in their county, if I remember correctly? This hasn't been just um, mentioned in the last presentation yesterday or today. So that's a, a, an important question to ask. Um, does San Luis Obispo County have to approve the, the Interlake Tunnel since it's really in, in, in their jurisdiction? Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. <clears throat> and next we have Tom Versick. If you could please press star six to unmute yourself. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, thank you, Chair Tom Versick speaking. Um, I will agree with Mr. Farrow. No need to say anything more on those particular topics. Instead, let me remind those who may be listening or watching about the Water Forum last week, which was focused on the four basins in the north um, that are in overdraft and seawater intrusion and the fact that they either need to use less or have more water. And as Mr. Farrow said, this project does not target them. There's a certain amount of water, but at that cost point, it seems a little peculiar. The model, if one pays attention to the presentation, will not be available until 2023, which means the public will have no idea about the legitimacy of any of these numbers until after that point. And may I point out that yesterday, at the presentation at the Water Resources Agency, there was the same amount of proclamations about clarity and real estate numbers, et cetera, but it turned out that one of the key slides was completely wrong, as they told us today. What else will be wrong? What else needs to be looked at? And I will also remind everyone that the GSA is looking at a different version of the model for its purposes because it serves it better, same USGS model, and that the prior version of the USGS model was completely off on water use. So there's a huge amount of work that needs to be done, which is why the caveat is there. And finally, last point for those who say, where are we going to be in 20 or 30 or 40 years? Look at the GSPs. The South will be okay. The North will not. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Versick. I see no other hands raised at this point from attendees or panelists, or attendees I should say, and no one else in the audience. Um, I'll bring it back to the board for final questions and, uh, and comments. And Supervisor Lugaski, your hand is up. Great, thank you. So I do have a couple more follow uh, questions following our public comment. Um, but wanted to go back to um, one of the slides that I had a second ago. Um, spoke about the um, changes Okay, I'm going to do my first question first. <laughs> so in regards to the DWR grant, if the tunnel is not, um, if we don't move forward with that, what is the status of that grant? We will, we will spend the entire $10 million, and, and then whether it moves forward or not, that's, that's just how it is. We, don't, we have not received any money for the uh, $17 million for the fish screen. Okay, and then the, the role of San Luis Obispo? So, uh, my understanding is the regulatory agencies, so it will be Division of Safety of Dams and the FERC and Ron. Help me, does uh, San Luis Obispo County involved in any of that permitting? They're, they're involved from a building permit standpoint, but they're uh, at the moment not a, uh, well, that'll be part of the engineer's report, whether they're a financial participant or not. So there may be some involvement there, but certainly part of the project is in San Luis Obispo County and that will involve a, you know, the normal building permit process for that. So, okay, thank you. Um, so on page uh, seven, it talks about um, the changes to the hydro hydraulic models incorporated water rights limitations and environmental commitments. Can you just speak a little bit more to what those changes were? 
Sure. So the on the water rights front, um, we uh, incorporated logic into the model so that it tracks um, how much water is being um, considered like withdrawn and counted as withdrawals every year from the reservoirs so that we would not exceed our permitted um, water rights. And it also incorporates some of the more fine details um, about the water rights rules. There are you know things related to how long the water has been stored and how long you know how it gets counted toward the water rights and all of that logic is part of the model now so that we would be um, compliant with our existing water rights you know with the benefits numbers that were shown today and then the environmental commitments speak to things like the flow prescription um, related to steelhead so maintaining minimum flows at specific times of year um, providing conditions for fish passage that are defined in that flow prescription. So all of that was folded into the model so that we are meeting those commitments as well. Okay, thank you. And the water, so going back to the water rights limitation um, issue and sort of the question of um, for water that flows back into the aquifer, um, the thirsty, the river is thirsty, and when we have water uh, needs in the north, um, to, to the north of the basin, are there water right issues that are at play that are being modeled uh, to account for that? The w only water rights that are in the model are related to the agency um, and how the reservoirs are operated. So it does not, um, you know, account for other sort of overlying water rights or things like that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Rudasky. Supervisor Lopez. I, I just want to say I'm appreciative of the presentation and all the great materials that have been presented, especially the updates on data and some of the recruiting that's been done. I do still have that same concern that was raised by one of our public speakers about just kicking the tires on the mall. And I know we've said that sort of from the beginning. I've had a lot of community groups from the beginning say we need to see that. And so you know, I, I appreciate the timeline that's put in front of us, but I, I still have that question of how that timeline is going to be true up with that request that's been there from the beginning. But overall, I'm excited about the opportunity and what I'm seeing in the numbers. I just have that question about what we intend to do if the timelines don't match up on making sure that the public has access to the model. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor uh, <coughs> Yeah, and that's why um, I think I think uh, it's it's a, it was important to hear that these numbers are, aren't expected to change, and it's important for the community to know that these numbers have been worked on at least for three years. It's been a very long time, and a lot of vetting, a lot of back and forth. Uh, but I, it's, it's important to hear that we got the numbers and hear that we don't expect them to change uh, from here forward. So I think these numbers are are pretty reliable. And had these numbers not been good, it would be the the, the people. Some of the people making comments would have been all over it, saying, "Oh, the numbers aren't good, and therefore it, it would favor to to their positions and to their clients' positions." So um, I, I get it. We're in the world of politics, but I, I, I'm assured that a lot of science has been put on there, a lot of work, and um, has been put on these numbers. Uh, that they are reliable, and like I said, um, if, if we don't look towards the future and really see this part of our critical part of our future, not only. But most importantly for agriculture, for sure, because that puts food on the table of millions of Americans all over our country that rely on the work that gets done here by our farmers and our farm workers. But it's also important to a lot of other critical aspects. So um, you can't have housing without water. You can't have um, a sustainable future without uh, an important water supply when we're our, we are on our own in this region of California, a very important one for, for that matter. Um, so I, I, I look forward to us now um, having further conversations now that these numbers are out and, and seeing where we go from here, I, I look forward to having conversations with the governor's office, the legislature. Uh, I, um, hearing some of the comments, it reminded me back going back to 2013 or 2014 when uh, Nancy McFadden, the governor Brown's chief of staff, called me and reported us that we were the only project, um, only the only water project to get the $10 million out of the general fund that particular year. Uh, no other one uh, got one. Uh, she passed away four years yesterday, so some of the people that were involved in this effort are no longer even with us. So it, it just shows how long and um, how long it takes to get water products done in California. And any 
uh, water project, water storage project, it goes hand in hand with groundwater recharge. Um, all of them throughout the state, if you look at temperate flats, sites, all the other reservoirs, groundwater recharge is a key part to any water storage project because it does have that, that, that combined, um, uh, that interrelation between both. And, and but I, I see this, and it wasn't mentioned, but I always like reminding us that, that when it comes to the flows, that means uh, flows for protected species, but also water quality. When our groundwater um, aquifers drop, there's a greater risk of, of higher nitrates in the water. So I always look at, when I look at the disadvantaged communities like San Lucas and San Ardo, um, San Gerardo that, that historically have had uh, water and still have water challenges, I, I also like to put in perspective that this is a benefit for those disadvantaged communities also, not to mention uh, saltwater intrusion uh, problems that we continue to have in, in Monterey County. So um, I'm glad these numbers are out. I, I'm, I'm looking forward uh, to those uh, extensive conversations. I know some there are going to be some who don't, who will never su uh, support the Interlake Tunnel Project, uh, but but I, I hope that people could really see this as, as looking into the future to making sure that we remain a very strong, very vibrant agricultural region and that we look to provide the water needs uh, for our future generations in Monterey County. That we, that we look, that, that we appreciate that whatever the costs are today, they're going to be greater, much greater into the future. And so this is a time with the record budget, record surplus to ask the state to help us really offset uh, these costs um, which, as Supervisor Phillips also recognized, they're modest when you compare to the multi-billion uh, dollar um, other water source projects in other, in other other parts of our state. So thank you very much, and I appreciate this, and um, I look forward to us um, moving to the next com conversations on this project. Thank you. Thanks, Supervisor Lego. Supervisor Phillips, have any comments at this point? So thank you very much for all of the comments. This has been very um, illuminating to me. And um, I'm, I guess one of the things that I'm wondering about and that I look forward to understanding better is how this project interacts with all of the other projects that we have that are already in existence going down through the valley. I was troubled when I heard one thing about this, only, this is only going to impact people from Chular South, essentially. And I would want to make sure that we would be able I, you know, I don't know how all of this works, so forgive the naivete here, but if we're talking about a 218 vote, and if there's some way that we could get water north of, of, uh, of Chular to the other parts of the county that need, the other parts of the Salinas Valley, I should say, the farmers that need the water, therefore more people would be involved in a 218. I can see where it might be something beneficial, but once again, I am clueless on how um, how we move water around in our, in our county, but I, this is been very eye-opening for me, and I really appreciate all the time and effort that has gone into into the presentation. I think it's been very, um, uh, very illuminating. <clears throat> I echo what Supervisor Alejo said in the sense that there are always going to be people who are opposed to it, and I'm sure of that. And I'm sure there are many other elements that we've not um, had an opportunity to really fully consider. Um, but I do think that this, you know, this is a very, very interesting one and far more cost-effective with the information that we currently have than some of the other water projects that we see here in the county, which cost you know upwards of a billion dollars. So you know, it sounds like we've been doing some bargain shopping here, and that always feels like a good a good thing to do. I do look forward to additional information on it as we move forward. I think it's going to be very important that everybody buys in on this if we decide to move forward with it. Um, it's 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 not going to be an easy project to uh, to continue to. Um, uh, complete without some sort of help from the state level or the federal level to be able to really bring some significant dollars into the county to be able to help fund it. So as we continue to move forward with our water forms um, and all of us learning a little bit more about other parts of the of the county, I think this is just such an important part of it to uh, for us to be able to think about. This is the last question that I have for you. Do we ever have to worry about silting up? Um, as far as Nascimento, you know, I know how it was with uh, Lake San, with um, the San Clemente Dam. Yeah, so when when the uh, reservoir was designed, there, there is a component for any dam that's designed, there's always going to be a component of, of sedimentation buildup in the dam. And so that's been accounted for uh, during the design. And 
it, it holds uh, what 377,900 acre feet, and we actually have had some training with um, Port Guanimi, the underwater construction battalion, and they've done some bathymetric analysis around the dam. And so we we looked at data over the years, and and we're not impacted at this point as uh, was seen in San Clemente and uh, out at Los Padres. But that's something that would be looked at as far as talking about doing. If we were to go forward with this project, yeah. yeah so those, those in, we don't see those impacts right now. So it, it's not a concern at this point. I mean, we've had some significant fires up in the watershed. We 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 collected tons and tons of debris that have entered the reservoir, and it the sedimentation is not at this point is not an issue. Not an issue at all. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much for everybody's comments and concerns. But that I'm um, sure. Yes. Uh, just, just to answer your question, I was wondering if uh, Mr. Drake and or Mr. Bookie could try to answer that question. I think it's a misrepresentation that um, that somehow there would be uh, no benefit. I don't want to end the conversation with leaving that out there because I think um, in the very beginning it was a lot of the farmers in the north part of the county that asked me to get involved. Now this was an issue that I was not involved in, and I, I got asked by local uh, stakeholders to get involved in this effort and. And so uh, they're very interested. And obviously, the groundwater recharge uh, through flows happened first in the south, uh, southernmost part of the Salinas Valley. But but I, I want to wonder if they could just address that that question. Yeah, I, I'd be happy to do super supervisor Alejo. So uh, as Mr. Farrow and Mr. Versick stated, you know, they they were commenting in regards to the Salinas Valley Basin Groundwater <coughs> Sustainability Agencies (GSPs) for those sub basins. So the Water Resource Agency and the SBB GSA, we meet weekly. Ron indicated in the presentation that we will be providing this data to the Salinas Valley Basin GSA, and we will continue those conversations. So it, it, it's not two entities working mm -hmm. going in opposite mm -hmm. directions. We are in parallel. Again, we meet every single week. We are talking about these details, and if when we present this data, they see something, or we see something different, we'll, we'll be sharing that together. And I know that both uh, the gentlemen attend those uh, SBB GSA board meetings, and we're talking about having a joint Water Resource Agency SBB GSA meeting, just so everyone understands that we are working together to for a solution. That's the whole hope, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for bringing back up, Supervisor Okay, with that, I'm going to close this item with a great deal.